hour for this virtual lunch and learn. Uh, my name is Andrew Nelson. I'm an education, education coordinator with Trees Atlanta. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to make sure that everyone ha has had a chance to answer the questions in this poll. Um, it's just to help us collect some data on who's coming to these events so that we can better tailor our content to you in the future. Let's take another few seconds if you haven't answered yet. Please. Hmm. I'll let you submit. Interesting. I've got sixty five percent of people submitting. Okay. Looks like the submit button isn't working. Um, We'll just cut it there. Um, if this is your first time at a Trees Atlanta event, can you just share that in the chat? Uh, if not, I'll assume that everyone else has been to an event before. And I'll calculate the data later. Cool. All right. All right, I'm gonna end the polling. Thank you very much. Okay. So if this happens to be your first event with Trees Atlanta, uh, I can tell you a little bit about us. I'm gonna pull up a quick slideshow. Yeah, so welcome to the Lunch and Learn. Um, Trees Atlanta is a nonprofit citizens group dedicated to protecting and improving the urban forest here in Atlanta um, through planting, conserving, and educating. Um, some pictures here of us doing some of our various programming. Um, we've been around since 1985, and to date, we've uh, planted over 140,000 trees in the metro area and counting. Um, but like the rest of the world, we've had to make a lot of adjustments to our work um, in the last year, but we do actually have a lot of exciting events um, to offer you in the near future. Um, so if you missed a slideshow that was playing before we started, here's the list again, uh, coming up in the near next month or so, of some things that we've got going on. Um, we've got planting projects every Saturday. Sorry, it's on auto scroll. So I'll be going back so that you can look at it. Um, and then a lot of education events tailored to different audiences coming up as well, both virtual and in person. Um, and then, yeah, Georgia Arbor Day is coming up. And so we're gonna have a, about a week's worth of events to celebrate that. You can see the list here of what we're gonna have going on. Um, yeah, so be sure to check out all those events going on throughout that week, including a, a memorial planning for John Lewis in Freedom Park that weekend. Um, so that's not the full list though, there are many others. So check out all our events on the web, on our website, www.treesatlanta.org. And we'll, uh, we'll see you online or out there in the world somewhere. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to play the main event of today's little production. Um, this is a pre-recorded video on some common invasive species that we have here in Atlanta. It features Dana Russell, a member of our forest restoration team, who will be helping us explore this topic. And then she's on with us and she'll be able to, um, she'll host a, a live Q&A um, after the showing. So if you think of any questions um, as they come to you, just go ahead and type them in the chat or you can use the QA feature if you want. I'll be able to, to monitor both. And then after the video, we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have. Uh, any questions so far? Let me check the chat. All right, well then here we go. Hmm. 
How you doing today? We are in the beautiful Kirkwood Urban Forest and my name is Dana Russell. I am an assistant coordinator for the forest restoration team with Trees Atlanta. And today I'm gonna to be taking you around the forest and showing you a little bit about invasive species and why they can be dangerous to our environment here in Atlanta. Um, an invasive species is a non-native plant that um, has no niche in our region here in the Piedmont. Um, oftentimes it can do more harm than good and it can crowd out other beneficial native species um, that are not only good for our wildlife, but can create a super healthy, self-sustaining ecosystem. Um, oftentimes invasive species will take over an area and they'll crowd out everything else in the seed bank and that can lead to a monoculture which um, is just a one plant environment and that's just super unhealthy. So talking about non-native invasives, um, oftentimes they're brought to our region um, from places like Asia or wherever else um, for ornamental purposes because they look pretty or because they're super easy to maintain and you don't have to water them a lot or put really any effort into it, um, which makes them appealing for homeowners and landscapers. And um, oftentimes they're sold at places like, you know, Lowe's, Ace, Home Depot, wherever. Um, so that being said, today we're gonna learn a little bit about how to effectively remove some specific non-native invasives that we frequently see here in Atlanta and how to keep those invasives away. And I'll even give you some pointers on a native or two to replace it with. So that being said, let's get rid of these. Okay, here we have English ivy. And when we're IDing English ivy, it's super common, so it's pretty easy. You're gonna see it a lot. Um, it's typically pretty dark green with like a glossy finish. Um, it's got light green veins. Um, it's lobbed typically with three points, um, sometimes five. Um, it's gonna have a light brownish tan bark. Um, newer growth is gonna be kind of red colored on the bark. Um, and when the vines get really mature and large, they're gonna be super hairy. Um, but it's gonna be still have this light coloring. Um, another thing that can kind of resemble it is poison ivy, but poison ivy is always gonna be of super dark brown. Um, so if you're ever seeing a giant hairy vine on a tree that you think might be English ivy, try to remember English ivy is the light colored, poison ivy is the dark colored, um, and English ivy won't attack your skin. So that's that on that. Um, next step is to remove it from the tree. So here we have English ivy. Um, as you can guess by its name, it's native to England and it was brought here um, for mainly ornamental purposes. Um, it's a great privacy shield, um, still super, super frequently planted by landscapers and homeowners. Um, but as you can see here, it's a huge issue for our forests and our trees. Um, if you look around, the forest floor is covered in ivy. And what that's doing is it's, it's occupying all of the seed bank so that it's super difficult for our native trees and perennials and everything else to grow and create a healthy, sustainable forest. Um, and the issue with trees is that it latches on and girls the tree um, and will completely cover the tree and not only be an additional weight on the tree, but it can eventually cover its foliage. foliage so the tree can't provide food for itself. Um, also with that additional weight, any kind of serious rainstorm, windstorm, ice storm is going to put the tree at risk of falling over and dying. Um, so the best way to remove English ivy is going to be to cut it off 
from its nutrient source. Um, so what we want to do is you want to cut high and cut low. Um, you can do it at head height or chest height. And then you want to completely remove from there to the ground and create a buffer zone. Um, the best way to do that is to cut and pull. Um, but if you can't completely pull the ivy from the ground, you can just cut it at the source. Um, and yeah, that's a great way to save the tree. And obviously, you know, ivy is a super aggressive vine. So you'll have to keep monitoring the buffer zone that you create to recut it. Um, but eventually it will die. Um, and once you've created that buffer zone too, it's a lot easier to pull up and remove the root system from the ground so you can ensure that it's gone for good. All right, so when we are removing English ivy, we wanna cut it high and low, and again, create that buffer zone to where we can monitor its regrowth so we can continue to cut it back and save our precious tree. Okay. So making that first high cut, oftentimes you can cut it off and kind of peel it back off the tree. This one's a little difficult to pull, so we're going to go ahead and cut it. Again, as low as you can, just like any anything else you're removing, you want to eliminate that surface area for regrowth, to prevent regrowth. Alright. Boom. Pretty easy to uproot, pretty easy to pull. Um, this is a good sign. You know you're removing the source and killing it. And don't forget, create that buffer zone. Um, if you are hand pulling the ivy, a hard wake is a great tool. Um, it allows you to really clear the base of the tree and also it's a good way to uproot the vines um, so you can get your hands on them and all right here we have here the finished product we have got our gap from head to foot we have cleared the base of the tree and we have our beautiful buffer zone so we can monitor the regrowth and continue to pull back that ivy and cut it, whatever we need to do. Um, again, if you have a super thick vine, use your saw. Don't be afraid to get in there. Um, English ivy is relatively easy to manage. You just have to monitor it. Um, it is a tree killer. That and kudzu are probably the number two, one and two tree killers in Atlanta. So if you are going to plant English ivy, please plant it inside in your house in a pot. It's a great air filtering plant and it's kind of cute, but just not on my trees, not on my trees. Here we have leather leaf mahonia. Um, leather leaf mahonia is native to Asia. Um, as you can see, it's super funky looking, um, which makes it another commonly planted ornamental. Um, the first thing that you want to do before you remove it is take these seeds out. Um, a simple snip. And then place it in our yard bag. Um, when you're IDing Mahonia, you want to look out for these super wide spiky leaves. Um, it's a very distinctive shape and look and it's, it's a relatively easy one to identify. Um, it kind of resembles Nandina um, and the bark 
bark coloring and bark formation. Um, again, they're both native to Asia, so they they have a lot of simple char similar characteristics. Um, but leatherleaf mahonia is super spiky, so when you're removing it, if you need to, um, make sure that you have pruners so that you can kind of clear the way so that you can get to the base of the shrub. So, just like the removal of all invasives, we want to cut mahonia as low to the ground as we can get it, remove that surface area, and then we're going to spray it with our herbicide. Um, mahonia is another one that can be pretty difficult to pull and uproot. Um, so unless you have an uprooting tool, cutting is the best method. Um, if you don't have herbicide, you just want to continue to cut it, strip away that regrowth, and starve the roots of its nutrients. funky yellow color. Um, Nandina can have a similar color as well. All right, so once we've cut down our Nandina as far as we can get it, we're going to take our handy dandy herbicide and we are going to treat it. Just covering the surface and that's going to be absorbed into the root system and hopefully kill it. Here we have Liriope, aka monkey grass. Um, super, super common, found in homes, found in forests, um, but it is a forest floor pest. Um, as you can see, it grows wide um, and it takes up a lot of the space on the forest floor um, that would otherwise be open for more beneficial native plants to grow. Um, and in addition to that, it produces berries that are pretty attractive for birds and other wildlife to, to eat and munch on. Um, and so they eat it and they walk around the forest and then they do their business and then the seed germinates and the problem is spread throughout our forest floor. So before you r remove the liriope, you want to take your pruners you want to snip off any berries that it may have and then you're going to dispose of it in our handy dandy yard bag. A great tool to use to remove Libriope is this handy dandy little twist tiller. Um, it can be found at a Home Depot, Lowe's or any local um, supply store. Um, if you don't have one of these, you can hand pull it. It's just a little more tedious on your back. Um, so yeah, check out home people. <laughs> um, but anyways, we take the tool and we just simply dig and twist. got it uprooted. Um, the last thing we want to do is we want to put it in our handy dandy yard bag again. Um, these roots are constantly searching for moisture once you've taken them out of the ground. So if you just leave it on the ground it can reroot and all your hard work was done for nothing. Um, if you don't have a yard bag, putting it on some sort of elevated surface like a rock or a log that's nearby, that'll suffice as well because it's gonna allow these guys to dry out before they're able to reroot. So here we have the invasive plant, um, sacred bamboo, AKA Nandina domestica. Um, this is a shrub native to Asia. Um, it's really popular um, being planted by homeowners and landscapers for its ornamental purposes, as you can see, in the fall, it kind of gets this reddish color um, and people think it's very visually appealing. One reason Nandina is popular amongst homeowners and landscapers is for its bright red berries. 
but these berries are extremely toxic to birds and can cause cyanide poisoning. Um, what that does is it creates hemorrhaging within the bird's body and it will swiftly die. Um, so that is just one reason to take this out of your yard, tell your local pike or lows or whatever it is to not sell it and replace it with a native tree or shrub like devil's walking stick for example which also produces berries um, that our wildlife love and is nutritious and won't kill them so when you're iding nandina um, you want to look for this tripinnate compound leaf um, as you can see it's got a red coloring um, this often occurs in the fall and in the winter as well as along the stem so the first thing that you want to do when you're removing nandina is you want to cut the berries um, this is to prevent any wildlife from eating it off the forest floor and also to prevent it from germinating and creating a whole new shrub um, you want to dispose of it in some kind of bucket or a yard bag like this boom and now we're good to go all right so when you're removing nandina you want to take your saw and you want to cut the base of the shrub as low to the ground as you can get it um, this is so it has the least amount of surface area possible to prevent regrowth after we've treated it with our herbicide we've cut our nandina as low as we can get it removing that surface area we're going to use our herbicide to treat the stump if you don't have an herbicide to treat the stump you can keep cutting it down and removing any regrowth that occurs this will starve the root system and eventually it will die um, another great uh, alternative is using an uprooter to completely remove it from the ground and get the entire root system. Um, Nandina can be super difficult to hand pull, so don't break your back. <laughs> Here we have another pesky invasive silverthorn, aka autumn olive. Um, the best way to ID this one is locating its pointy thorns, hence the name silver thorn. And next, it's silver undercoating um, on the back side of its leaves. It's kind of whitish, kind of silverish, but very easy to spot. Um, as you can see here, it's like growing all kinds of crazy. It's kind of like a tree. It's kind of like a shrub. Um, but the way that it's spreading out, not only is it, you know, pushing into the nearby trees, it's going to shade out everything that's on the ground floor um, and take up that sunlight and just be a little pet. So, the best way to remove silver thorn is first to limit up. Um, you want to make sure that you're not going to get stabbed. So you want to take your pruners, make some cuts. Get that out of here. Keep cutting until you're able to kind of clear a pathway to the base of the tree. Silver thorn is another one. Not easy to uproot, um, not only because of its thorns, just because it has a little bit of a deeper root system than something like privet or bush honeysuckle um, that has a super shallow and wide root system. Um, so yeah, you just wanna clear out your space so you can get to the base of that tree. And then from there, you can make um, a cut with your saw and if you have an herbicide you want to treat the stump if you don't have an herbicide um, you want to just monitor it and keep cutting it 
um, every time it produces um, new regrowth and eventually it will starve and die. So after we've snipped all of our dangerous branches and cleared the base of all the thorns, so you won't, you know, go dry out, then you want to take your saw and cut this stump as low to the ground as possible, just like anything else you would remove. When you're cutting um, an invasive woody, um, just like really cutting anything else, it's pretty, pretty obvious, but you want to cut in the direction that the tree or shrub is leaning. Um, otherwise, your saw is going to get pinched and you're going to either get stuck or it's just going to be a pain. Um, so this guy is leaning pretty far forward, so I'm going to cut from the back. down our silver thorn, we're going to treat it with our handy dandy herbicide. Just a little spritz. And we're good to go. Okay guys, I hope that you have enjoyed these little demonstrations of how to remove some super common invasives that we see here in Atlanta. Um, another great resource to find more in-depth information on how to do this and how to identify it is on our website at www.treesalana.org. Um, we have a resources link um, that has information on invasives as well as many other things um, that Trees Atlanta offers. And also, come volunteer with us. If you want to learn more about this, you want an in-person, close-up and personal experience. Every Saturday, come volunteer with us. There's a forest restoration project going on from 9 to noon. Um, you could even come volunteer with me here at the lovely Kirkwood Urban Forest. Um, just to close you guys out and give you a little peek of some beauties that we have naturally occurring here in the Piedmont. Um, we have my favorite cute cute cross vine um fun fact one way to tell if a vine is naturally occurring or non-native invasive um, is the way that it's going to climb the tree right you can see that this is far out it's not girdling the tree it's following the sun and then kind of just like working in unison with the tree to um, get that sunlight um, an invasive vine is going to latch on and twine itself around the tree, girdling it and suffocating it. And in addition to our native cross vine, we have the wonderful native cherry tree, as well as my personal favorite, the fern. So when you guys come out and volunteer with us on a Saturday or on a weekday, not only are you going to learn about invasive species and how to remove them effectively, but you're also going to learn a lot about these native beauties. Um, so come out with us, nine to noon on a Saturday. Come plant some trees with us. If you come to six projects, you even get a t-shirt. Thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Hey everybody. Um, I was told that there was a little bit of a lag there between the audio and the video, so apologies if um, that was an issue for you. But there we have it. Um, yeah. Thank you for thank you to Dana for being featured and being the star of that little film. And she's on here with us now for a Q and A. If anybody has any questions. Hey y'all. Hey Dana, how's it going? Pretty good. Hope awesome. y'all liked my girl versus wild out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Alex.
there's a lot coming in from like the chat and the Q&A, so bear with me if I'm not answering your questions super fast. Um, I got a lot of questions about um, what herbicide I was using in the concentrate. Um, it's a, it's Rodeo is the brand, which is um, a glyphosate, um, and we use that at 40%. So it's pretty diluted. Um, Rodeo is something that's safe to use around water as well. Um, so yeah, we oftentimes use chemicals in situations where, you know, it's too hard to remove it without, or um, if we don't want to disturb, you know, the seed bank around it and create more erosion, um, it's always a good, good option. Japanese chaff flower suggestions I see on here. Um, that's a bad one. Um, very, very invasive, spreads super, super fast. Um, a good ground cover alternative, kind of like blankets the ground floor is partridge berry. Um, Blue-eyed grass is something that I always recommend. It's really pretty, um, has like beautiful little purpley blue flowers. Um, cardinal flower is a really, really pretty natural um, ground cover flower. Um, hummingbirds love it for its beautiful little red flowers. Um, yeah, those are some options for you. Chaff flower can be really difficult to remove. So you wanna try to get it when it's not seeding and pull it from the ground and completely uproot um, that root system and bag it, get rid of it. Is there a good time of year for that? Like, do you know when it's not seeding for the most optimal time? Um, it seeds in the fall and winter. So um, getting in the summer and spring months is gonna be the best time. Um, and our resources page on treesalanta.org can give you better images of that um, so that you can ID, ID it at home. Uh, <clears throat> where can you find blue-eyed grass? Um, if you can't find it at like Pike or Home Depot or something, um, we have plant sales twice a year. Um, and we'll be working on a resource soon to be able to give you options of where you can purchase these native plants. Um, and that'll come up on our website as well. Um, let's see. Looking for corrosion control while waiting for natives to grow anywhere. Um, erosion control while waiting for natives to grow. Um, I mean, something that's, you know, used to, um, sorry, I have someone here with me who's like talking in my ear. She's also on the FR team. <laughs> so she's my, she's my backup. Um, but leaves, mulch, hay is a great thing to occupy the ground cover. Um, it'll kind of help to keep the soil in place um, and, keep it all from washing away. Um, also clover is a great thing to just like seed out there. Um, it grows really fastly and it winterizes really well. Um, so while your hillside is bare, that's a great option for you. Um, let's see. Um, speaking to Trees Atlanta expanding focus on invasive removal. I've heard y'all were starting to take this on even more. Um, yeah, we have a lot of different ideas in the works for how we can um, better interact with removing invasives and in our communities and that being like people's yards in addition to our parks. Um, but, you know, we're constantly getting new contracts and um, trying to expand our contracts with the city of Atlanta to work and um, yeah, as many parks as possible. Um, also leads from you know neighbors and people from the community contacting us is super helpful. Um, we work in over like I think thirty different parks now, um, so we're getting there. Uh, as we remove non-native shrubs, how do we not end up depriving birds of habitat? I see birds living in privet all the time and worry about destroying their safe space. Great question. Um, so. The, 
the nutrients that birds get from a privet berry is like, it's like fast food, right? So if they're getting nutrients from a native shrub like beauty berry, for example, which has like bright pink berries, um, they are, it, that is grown to feed the native birds in the environment. Um, privet is just like a super awful sort resource um, of nutrients for the birds. Um, also, you know, bugs on the ground, those birds, if you're removing um, a privet, for example, like they're gonna find the bugs in place on the ground floor to, to make up for that. <laughs> um, and just replacing what you're removing with something that you know is gonna is gonna fruit, right? So um, spice bush, beauty berry, um, arrowwood, elderberry, you know, we have so many great natives that provide super nutritious fruit for our bird population here in Atlanta. So just doing your research to make sure that you know um, if you're removing one that you're replacing it with something that's equally if not more nutritious for the bird. Um, and again, you can find that resource on our website at Trees Atlanta. Can you substitute jeweled weed when, when pulling out chaff flower? Um, jewelweed rocks, it's one of my favorite. Um, hummingbirds also love jewelweed. Um, but jewelweed typically grows in super moist soils. Um, chaff flower, um, it being an aggressive, you know, non-native invasive, there's not a lot to um, harm it. So like it, it can really lash on anywhere. Um, so it, de it, it depends on where you are removing that chaff flower, if that jewelry will be successful. Um, so yeah, just knowing the land and researching like your options. Where can we find these ground covers you're suggesting? Um, again, if you, I can, we have lists um, on our website and like, I'm happy to send Andrew uh, the information that I've researched um, that he can provide you guys through email um, about good alternatives. Um, but again, like just looking at your no local nurseries um, and yeah, hopefully our resource to um, direct you guys where to buy those will be up soon so that you can reference that. Uh, when pulling the IVF tree, can you damage the tree if the bark pulls off? Yes. Um, I mean, when you're removing it from head or chest height down to the base, um, you know, that's only a small portion of the tree. So it's better to remove it and maybe harm a little bit of the bark than to leave it obviously. Um, but really the most damage is gonna come if you try to remove those, those upper um, vines. Um, so I know when you initially remove that gap, you're gonna see it, you know, still green and very much alive above your head. And some people might be inclined to like get it all down. But if you're pulling those, those vines down, um, that's really gonna harm the tree because oftentimes you can break off limbs um, and you know disturb really lar much larger chunks of bark. Um, and if you're breaking off limbs, it could hit you in the head. So uh, it can also hurt you. <laughs> you don't want that. Um, native clover, white clover is a great one. Crimson clover is a great one. Um, we have a, t we have a lot of different, um, native cl clovers. Um, best way to eradicate wisteria. Oof. Um, wisteria and kudzu are hand in hand, you know, they're super aggressive. They create like a taproot system, um, and they spread far and wide. Um, for us, the best way to treat wisteria is through a foliar spray. Um, we work with it in like really large masses. Um, if you, you know, have no access to an herbicide, um, what I would recommend is being able to ID the vines uh, without the foliage. Um, that way in the winter, you know, you can cut all the vines off the trees and wherever it may be in your yard. Um, and you can like get a head start on it from 
the regrowth in the spring and summer. Um, and when you're cutting those vines, you want to make sure you're cutting it from everything that it's climbing. And also you can dig it up. Um, it's definitely one of the more difficult methods, but it's pretty effective if you're doing it in the winter time. Um, you can dig up that root system that way in the spring and the summer months, when it's regrowing, you can monitor it and continue to cut away the regrowth um, and it'll eventually starve it and it'll die. It'll take a long time. Uh, wisteria is very, very vicious, but eventually you'll get, you'll get there. Um, Dutch clover in Georgia. I'm not super familiar with Dutch clover, so I, I really don't have an answer for that. Um, but next one is Japanese stilt grass. How do you remove it and prevent it? Um, so yeah, that's one that it definitely blankets the ground cover. Um, but the best way to remove it is just to be diligent about pulling it. Um, and when you're pulling um, weeds in general, you know, you want to be intentional with it and make sure that you're getting the entire root system. If you go in there and just kind of go ham, it's, you know, not really going to do much. You're basically going to be mowing the lawn. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you are keeping at it, um, getting the entire root system and then replacing it as soon as possible with um, another native ground cover. Clover, um, you know, any kind of grass, uh, St. John's wort, you know, cardinal flower, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, but yeah, remove it, replant quickly. That's the best way. Suggestions for removing Japanese hops. Okay, hops are like super spiny and thorny. Um, so first thing I'll say when you're removing them, use gloves because they will tear your hands up. Um, job, uh, hops is actually very easy to pull though. Um, so if you have the right tools and, and gloves, you can pull hops. Um, one thing that you want to be, um, you want to be safe of though, is hops often grow on like stream banks and hillsides. Um, so you want to be aware of your surroundings and where you're removing it so that you're not doing more harm than good um, and creating erosion problems. And um, yeah, again, just being able to have a plan for what you want to replant after you remove, um, depending on the space that you're removing it from. Been working at the Wisteria for three years. I bet it'll probably be three more. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading as I go, y'all. Does anyone know the longer weeds that have thorns, but not as long as silver thorn? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of thorny stuff out there. I know that one that we commonly work with is um, multiflora rose. Uh, it's like a bushy, um, yeah, rose shrub, um, very thorny. I don't really. Madison says uh, blackberry, maybe. Blackberry, that's a good one. Let's see. Taryn suggested trifoliate orange. Um, there's a lot of it. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I'm missing? There's some in the chat, yeah. Okay, hold on, sorry. Yeah, I think the first one that was asked was any specific treatments to widespread kudzu have kept low by mowing for a couple of years but continues to return? Um, I think my best advice would be like the same as wisteria. Um, chemical is going to be the best treatment for such aggressive invasives like kudzu. Um, but you know, oftentimes can't get your hands on it or don't want to use it. Um, so just keeping at it. Um, mowing it isn't the best option. Um, you really want to try to remove that root source. Um, so just continuously cutting it back and trying to find the node system, um, which can grow huge, uh, like bigger than my head and tap down into the ground and just be like, almost impossible to remove. But if you're able to dig that out, um, you're gonna have a head start on uh, getting rid of it as fast as possible. Um, okay, what's next? 
Uh, which one did you mention that hummingbirds love? Uh, hummingbirds love carnal flower. I think that might be the one that I mentioned. Um, but another um, native tree that hummingbirds love is red buckeye and also jewelweed. I think I mentioned that one. Yes, they're very attracted to red flowers. Um, let's see. <laughs> Greg says, leave your leaves. Grace's. Um, sorry, what was that, Andrew? I uh, just said Grace's was next on Mimosa. Mimosa, do you recommend removing it or is it okay to stay? Um, I believe Mimosa is level two on the invasive scale. So that means it's like a moderate uh, risk for our environment. Um, but as we leave it, that number is gonna continue to grow. Um, so I would definitely recommend removing it. Um, but one thing I will say about Mimosa, it has a lot of medicinal qualities. Um, the flowers and the bark are often used to treat depression and anxiety. Um, there are ways that you can break it down into like a tincture or a tea um, that are really, really good to, to treat those things. So it's definitely remove it, but maybe like, maybe harvest it first and <laughs> get yourself some anti-anxiety goods. Uh, let's see what's next. All right, Grace's question, it's a lot. Can you speak to the interim habitat accommodations for bird wildlife? When removing the invasive shrubs, is there a way to replace or substitute for the cover that is removed? Um, I think I kind of touched on this earlier, talking about the removing of the privet. Um, I think it comes down to just having a plan um, with what you're going to substitute that invasive with. Um, doing your research, knowing what, you know, birds are in the area and what those birds might be attracted to. Um, I, I mentioned a few, um, beauty berry, beauty berry, elderberry, um, winterberry, spicebush, arrowwood. Those are all good ones. Um, also, when you're removing those um, invasives, you're creating further habitat through your brush piles. Um, you know, that's giving habitat to creatures that might be on the ground floor, like um, chipmunks and also birds for nesting. Um, and also um, planting shrubby stuff immediately after, um, that's going to be fast growing and occupy the ground cover um, to help restore um, and substitute for what you're removing. Um, okay, let's see what else. Uh, Greg says, mimosa, kill it. You're right, Greg, you're right. Uh, Will Hazelson wants to know if we've used vinegar as an herbicide and if we've had any luck with it. No, I haven't personally. Um, no. <laughs> um, there are a bunch of wacky methods out there. I know that my mom uses like eggshells to just try, try to keep critters out of her like planters. <laughs> um, but vinegar as an herbicide, I can't say that I've used it. Which clover is deer friendly, trying to have bird friendly and deer friendly yard? I would say all clover is deer friendly. Um, deers will eat pretty much anything. I don't think, yeah, there's, there's not much that's not deer friendly. <laughs> um, info opinions on Bradford pear trees. Okay, my opinion is that they're bad. I actually had one fall in a storm in my backyard and it took down the fence, um, luckily it was away from the house, but they're just like super, they, they have super poor structure. Um, they're just kind of ugly um, <laughs> and they smell bad. Uh, the fruits 
and yeah, they, they're just like fast, fast spreading and they don't offer a lot of ecological benefit. Um, so yeah, I'd remove them. They're risky, not cute, gotta go. Yeah, and what Greg said, try to figure out what would specifically be growing in your ecosystem. I think that's super important for um, the removal of invasives, always doing your research to know what you want to replant in their place and know why and how that's gonna benefit um, your green space or your, your home, you know, like creating a little pollinator garden in your front yard, you're gonna be seeing beautiful butterflies and birds and you know, who doesn't want that? And there you are. Um, let's see, what do we have in the Q and A? Anything else? Fastest grow, fast growing tree suggestion. Um, fast growing tree suggestion. I would say a sumac's a good one. It'll shoot up. Um, Oh, that's the only one that's come to mind right now. But I would say when you have the option and the opportunity, you want to plant oaks as much as you can. Um, they are slow growing, but they are they grow like super huge and they provide so much food and resources for wildlife. I think they host over 500 different species of caterpillars or different kinds of caterpillars. Um, so it's going to be the ultimate food source for birds. Um, and they're gonna sequester the most carbon once they're like big and strong. Um, so yeah, always, always plant with intention when you can. Um, another fast growing one is double walking stick. Um, it's a single stemmed tree that just shoots up. Um, yeah, someone said they've tried a liquid, a combo of Dawn liquid and vinegar and Epsom salt for killing weeds. And it does not work very well. <laughs> okay, so there's your answer on that. <laughs> Madison said, yay, devil's walking stick. It's a beautiful one. And it provides berries that birds love. And Greg added cherry. Cherry bark, oak, sycamore, tulip poplar, river birch, also great ones. <laughs> Sorry about that, Emily. <laughs> You're doing a good job reading pretty much everything. So sorry. Um, I think that's yeah. about it. Do we have any more questions? Did we touch on this one from Carolyn? I thought Dutch white clover was not native. We need a good erosion control material. Does clover grow the fastest? Um, I don't think Dutch white clover is native because I've never heard of it. Um, I mean, clover in general really isn't that native, um, but it's, it just spreads far and wide and it's gonna contain that um, topsoil. So that's why it's a good fast alternative. Um, it grows quickly, it's gonna pop up. Your topsoil is gonna stay in place uh, for the most part with that clover. So that's why I would recommend that. Best way to get rid of lots of privet. Um, best way to get rid of privet in general is to uproot it entirely eliminating that root system from the ground, you're ensuring that it's not gonna grow back. Um, when you're uprooting, you wanna be gentle. If you're breaking off the roots, it's defeating the purpose. Privet is super, um, super vicious and it will continue to re-sprout. Um, again, just continuously cutting, eliminating that regrowth, starving the root system of its nutrients. Um, yeah. Treat if you can, that's another way to guarantee that it's not gonna regrow. But without chemicals, just pull it, continue to cut it. Um, let's see, anything else? 
Ida asked about killing English Ivy. She was late tuning in. Ida, we have a really good segment on that in our video, and this is being recorded, so I can uh, make sure that you get a copy of this recording so you can see exactly how Dana did that. Um, Heidi, we treat uh, with a herbicide called Rodeo. It's a glyphosate, um, which is a diluted chemical. Um, it's similar to what you might find in like Roundup. Um, we use it because it doesn't contain any harsh like oils or surfactants, which is really what's detrimental for the waters and the environment. Um, we use it at 40%. Uh, so again, it's diluted. Um, but if you know, you're struggling with something in your yard that's like super aggressive and you need to cut and treat it, buying um, Roundup and simply using it to treat the stump um, and spraying it right at the source, um, that's gonna be super effective. And you know, you're not spraying it all over your yard so you don't have to worry about anything dying. And it's not something that you're gonna be really breathing in if you're only spraying it in a small spot. So it's super safe. Is there any way to require sellers to identify native versus non-native? Um, require that? I don't know. I don't think so when it comes to stores like Pike and everything else. Um, I don't think that there's any, any rule saying that they have to require that. Um, but I think that as you know, a community member, you can do your due diligence and only buying from from places that either sell those natives or will indicate when it's an invasive um, and yeah just researching before you buy and not uh, not contributing to their poor practices of selling rowdy invasives very important is it too late in the year to use it effectively um, when you're cut and treating, there's not really a time of the year that it's going to be ineffective unless it's like below freezing. Um, then you don't want to, to treat the stump because it's going to freeze and it's not going to be effective. It's not going to be able to absorb into the root system, right? That's, that's what's happening when you're treating the surface. Um, so yeah, as long as it's not raining to wash away um, or freezing, you're good to go whenever with, with the cut and treat method. Cool. I think we'll we'll end it at that. Thanks for all y'all's questions. It's really good. It was a really good, really good conversation. And thanks, Dana. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah. all your questions and it was fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, this is being recorded, so you guys can email me. Um, we'll put my email in the chat. If you want a copy of the recording or reference, it's just a Nelson at treesatlanta.org. And yeah, y'all have a great day. Um, I'll remind, there is another event focusing on invasives on, I think it's February 25th called Rethinking Invasives um, with Roots Down. So if you guys are interested in learning more about this topic, you guys can tune in to that. And yeah, you can find information about that on our events calendar. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, guys.